For the second time this year, I am interviewing Filip Rakowski from Vue Storefront. This is the second time because I'm collaborating with the Vue.js Global Conference um, where I interview the speakers so they can talk a little bit about their conference talk, go into depth on the tech, and then after that we can talk about whatever we want. But with that beginning part, the conference organizers can actually cut that out and use it as promotion. So these intros are generally really long. I'm just gonna not talk anymore and let's jump right in. Hello, Philip. How are you? Hey, good to see you, man. I'm really, really good. I had one week vacation, so I'm refueled. I'm back to work and I'm overwhelmed. Awesome. This is how it goes, right? Um, yeah. it's, it's kind of feels strange because we just did a whole fan, fun intro and then the camera was weird, but now it's good. But now we're kind of feeling like, anyways, we're just going to jump in, right? Yeah. So um, for the audience, this interview is kind of for the Fuji's global event. So we're talking about Philip's talk and then we go into depth a little bit about what he wants to talk about. So the conference organizers can cut it piece out and use it for promotion. And then after that, we'll just talk about whatever we want. So Philip, in that context, can you talk about your talk for a bit? Yeah, sure. So the the title of my talk is Introduction to Vue Storefront Text. And I think it's pretty self-explanatory, but you probably don't know what Vue Storefront Text is. I mean, you know that, but the audience doesn't know. Uh, so Vue Storefront Text is basically a new version of Vue Storefront that we we're building for last couple of months, I think. Since December last year, I think that that, that, that was the first time we, we, we committed something to be served on text. And we're really, really close to releasing this. And I think this talk will be the first ever introduction to, to this v from on text. And it also would be a great chance for everyone to actually see how it works, see which improvements we have made. And to those who don't know v from at all, uh, they will basically get familiar with uh, the whole uh, platform. Okay, so my next question was like, can you give like an elevator pitch of what it is, but you just did. So maybe what you can explain a little bit is like, why next? And what is kind of inside the next that makes it next? I will, but I think I will make an elevator pitch because like, okay, cool. Uh, I believe that if you're a developer and if you're doing anything related to e-commerce during your, during your daily job, View Storefront is most likely a tool that could solve you a lot of time and a lot of money. So I think it's worth like checking the talk at least to see the capabilities of the platform and to see if this is something that could potentially solve your prob problems or not. Uh, okay, so going from here uh, to what makes it next and what changes we have made. So basically, we have started building View Storefront, I think, three years ago, something like that. And, you know, when you're building something for the first time, it cannot be perfect. And it's usually a piece of shit. So you're iterate, iterating from piece of shit to something that is better and better and better based on feedback, based on your, your own experiences, also based on the fact that you're learning while you're building. Exactly. So we were doing this, we we're iterating for two and a half years. Uh, but at some point we saw that actually our architecture became a limitation. So we were enabled to apply all of our ideas that we wanted to apply based on this feedback from our community. Yeah. Uh, also, Vue.js uh, Vue Composition API came out. So ah, yeah, exactly. That was, that was kind of like a paradigm shift inside the frameworks. And we knew that everyone will use Composition API. And to embrace it, we had to actually make a really, really huge breaking change anyway. So then we thought, okay, so if we have to make a huge breaking change anyway, why don't we do a rewrite and fix, fix the architecture? So then it's more flexible and it's more future-proof, it's more modular, and we are not limited by it. So this is how we came up with Vista Front Next. And as you suspect from, from, from my previous sentences, this is basically a new Vista Front based on composition API. So instead of having a fully functional template for applications where you have a web pack build, when you have your own server set rendering, where you have your own plugin system, et cetera, we are only building the composition API functions. 
that can be used in any Vue.js application. So if you have uh, an application that is already running on Vue.js, uh, you can, for example, use some bits of that to display the, your product catalog or to even include a card. But all of that could be made within your currently existing application, which was impossible for, for the previous Vue storefront. Uh, on, on the other hand, for people, like majority of people, I think, uh, willing to create their e-commerce stores with Vue Storefront, we are using Nuxjs as our main driver. And this is really, really, really helpful for us because we don't have to maintain our own service set rendering, plugin systems, stuff like that. Moreover, we can benefit from all the Nuxjs modules, and there is a lot of them, and each of them are really, really high quality. Uh, actually, when I'm pitching the storefront to our clients right now, it's much, much easier because when they're asking for some specific feature, there is usually a Nux module for that. So we can just link it and tell them, hey guys, it's already there. Actually, I had that so a while back. Really cool. I was I was pitching Vue Storefront to one of our clients and they're like, yeah, but I don't know them and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, dude, but it's based on Nux. So any questions you have, you can just go there. And it calmed them down visibly in the meeting. And that was pretty cool to see. So that's actually yeah. a departure of what you had before, right? So the, the, the new thing is that you have Nuxt as the core. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. And also people trust Nuxt because it, it's a technology that is already there for a pretty long time. A lot of people are using this. Also exactly. companies like Louis Vuitton. Yes, that, exactly. That you have made. Uh, so it's much easier to pitch with such technology. Yeah, and so um, now that Nux is coming out with this full static mode and their content mode and all of that stuff, are you able to kind of merge your code base with that? Or is that still something that doesn't uh, make sense maybe? I think it makes sense perfectly because as I said, like this storefront next right now is just a set of functions mm -hmm. that are using composition API. So they, in theory, they could fit in any context. Of okay. course, like... You know, when, when you're making an e-commerce store, I I don't see that much value in using in using nice content for that. Usually there is a huge marketing team that is using some headless CMS. Yeah, exactly. Sure. For that. So next content is more like more more like a thing for, for developers, yes. Yeah, okay. But obviously like everyone can benefit from everything that Nax is bringing right now. So this is really cool. Exactly. And um, you actually used the composition API really early on because I remember you told me, I'm like, whoa, they, they just like released the beta or maybe it was even a bit before and you're already trying to use it with a plug into a few two. So it was still working. So that's like super bleeding edge, but you're making a product big stores yeah. are using, right? So how did that work? What happened there? Yeah, so like I, I think we, we start using composition API as soon as the plugin came out. So it wasn't ah, okay. even properly tested. It wasn't even like, to be honest, it wasn't a very wise decision, but it was the only decision that we were able to make because when you're building something on the old APIs and you know that there are new APIs that will be a standard, building on old APIs is basically saying that, okay, so we are building something that is already outdated. Yeah, exactly. That doesn't work. But the risk of using composition API was that at the time of finishing this, it won't be stable enough to actually push to production. Fortunately, it is right now, but for a very long time, it was our huge concern because we, we started using that and there was no way to make it uh, work with uh, server-side rendering, for example. Oh, yeah, exactly. And so speaking, now, speaking, is, is, yeah. This, is this all fixed now? Is it all working? Yes, more or less. Even though still like in, inside the code base, we have a lot of our own workarounds. For example, okay. like picking the server side state on, on the client side was really tricky and we have our own mechanisms for that. But okay. we're slowly rewrite, rewriting all of this to, to what Nux provided because they are they have released the Nux composition API module. Yes, has okay. A lot of composition, yes, yeah. composition API functions uh, that are basically making it possible to use Composition API plugin within Nux environment seamlessly. I kind of love that you're serving the wave of uncertainty, but then you are still on the top of the game. There's more and more companies using your tool. So with that in mind, that all these companies use it, right? So if you ship this as like a little box with the next, mm -hmm. what is inside? Do you have like the storefront UI or how, how opinionated are mm -hmm. you in the package that you give? So... 
like Vista, Vista Front Next is basically a set of independent packages, which could be used all together or standalone. And you are basically choosing what is in your stack. So most of the clients right now is choosing the full stack. So mm -hmm. the full stack is containing first the API client for each integration. API client is something that is completely framework agnostic and just like a tiny, tiny abstraction layer over a network. Calls. This is pretty useful in, in some node scripts and stuff like that. Yeah. And also uh, we have this composition API functions, which are using the API client. And this is, this, this is basically something that like 99% of the people will, will use all together. Okay. And apart from uh, Go on. yes, and apart from apart from that, you have uh, Nux module, our own Nux module that is doing a little bit of enhancements, mostly related to performance. So, so we are using ES modules of uh, of our integrations for tree shaking. We are using cross source of storefront UI stuff like that. And then you have storefront UI with a team. So if, 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 if you want to scaffold the application with ready to use uh, team, then right now we are forced to use storefront UI. But in the future, we are planning to also have kind of like a clean version of the team where you will have all the, all the JavaScript code, but there won't be any, uh, there, there won't be any CSS and the HTML markup will be just as, as small as possible just for, uh, to keep the functionalities working. Uh, this is what I like because honestly, in my day-to-day -day work, I see this all the time because I work in enterprise, right? Things are big and expensive mm -hmm. and slow. And what we tend to look at, like this is this is the question we always see, and we'll come to that a bit later when we discuss Mach, because basically we we have the difference between best of breed and best of suite, right? And generally, projects are we choose best of suite just because it's less. Um, haggling about contracts and stuff. But when you get this best mm -hmm. of suite approach, let's say you have an Adobe AEM or a Sitecore, you always get this whole chunk of stuff. And then when we see that bunch of code, we sometimes say, hey, but that doesn't really work. That's a bit weird. And then the company says, yeah, but you don't have to use it. It's just something we provide. But they don't always realize that basically 99% of people, when they have this super expensive suite, they will just use whatever you give them because they think, oh, it's expensive. You've worked on that for years. This is basically the best I'm going to get. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of assuming you're going to have a similar approach there because you do the storefront UI, you have all the connections in between, and you just say, okay, mm -hmm. here's the package, go. And you might say, yeah, but it's only for reference. Take it apart. And someone like me, I would take it apart. But not everybody is that um, has that skill set, right? So not all teams are like that. So do you see any sort of complaining from people about this uh, while, while you do the same as those big companies? No, actually, like every, everyone are pretty excited about that because for Vistorefront 1, we're shipping this huge, huge package where everything is bundled all together and mm -hmm. there's no other option than picking the default team with Vistorefront API and sure. basically then, then rebuilding it. And to be honest, we, lo we lost a few deals because of that. Because we start from like the, the current version is really, really advanced. It has a lot of features, but not everyone yeah. needs them. Okay. So in e-commerce, a lot of stuff isn't, there's like a lot needed in e-commerce, right? So you better yes. ship everything because I cannot tell you how often did I rebuild this, like the product page with like an image for the product and some small thumbnail. So you can click on the other product yeah. or a variant selector. We keep building that. And I think I've probably built like 15 of those for global brands and they're all relatively same, the same. So if we have a few storefront that gives us that, that works with accessibility and everything, actually that's really cool. Yes, so, exactly. Good for you. And like this, yeah, this, 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 this is why we're shipping storefront UI because this is kind of like bridging the gap between having e-commerce functionalities and having e-commerce store. Because for, for the store, the needs are usually more or less the same, to be honest. Like, they, they want accessibility, they want it to be fast, they want it to be user-friendly, uh, they don't want it to be ugly, they want it to be customizable. Yeah. And for like for big brands, they also want to have a possibility to have a more or less single code base that is shared between different brands. Yeah. And then components has to be customizable for, for, for each brand. So like that was the reason why we introduced our front UI. And yeah. that's the reason why like the biggest clients that we have currently most of them chooses to, to, to use their front UI because oh, this cool. is actually the tool that is solving their problems. But like the small, smaller clients or if you want to embed something into your website, you probably don't need that. 
No, and, exactly. and be, be, because because of that, we are shipping this composition API functions, which have very declarative API that is more or less like focused on getting things done, like Vue is. Yeah, exactly. So this is this this is more more or less in pair with like Vue way of thinking about building software. You don't want to go low level because what what, what I witnessed is that all these e-commerce stores that are built basically have more or less the same code, but it's still the code that is written on a low level. Yeah, exactly. So we are repeating, repeating the same thing on, on, on each headless store. So why you have to repeat that? Why can't we create a declarative API that is telling like place an order, add to cards, without additional bullshit that you have to configure, for example, to make it work, and then provide a configuration that you can use to actually configure those things. But the defaults should be like you're injecting the library, you're invoking the function, and every, everything is working. So that, that that was our goal. And I think such things are not present in e-commerce landscape right now. It's it, it's pretty overcomplicated. Um, I think maybe it was two or three weeks ago, I on LinkedIn, I don't go on LinkedIn that often, but I saw a post of you saying you are now the CTO of your storefront. That's cool, man. It sounds like a fancy title. I think you have been a CTO since you're a co-founder. It's your app. But now it's oh. official. So can you tell me what that means? Is that a change in the company, a change for you? What is this? Yeah, okay. So it, this this is pretty exciting stuff. Uh, I, I wouldn't say I was, a, I, I was a CTO for all the time. I was kind of like a junior CTO for most of the time. But like to answer this question better, I, I think I have to put a little bit of uh, like historical background. Uh, so right now, this storefront is still a part of an agency, Vivanta. Yeah. Yes. And we're constantly growing since the beginning, and we are at the stage where being a part of an agency started to be a little bit problematic. So okay. don't get me wrong. Like it's it's not it's not Vivanta's fault. It's basically. Uh, the, the problem is like, imagine being an agency and supporting some software that is part of the other agency, which is your competition. Yeah. So if you, if you like the software and want to support it, you're ending up supporting your competition. So we don't want to put our partners in a situation where they're forced to support their competition one way or another. So this is why we're spinning off from Vivanta. And okay. also if you're e-commerce vendor, you also don't want to favorize any, any agency above others because others would actually be pissed off, yes? Uh, so this storefront right now is, I think, like the biggest software of its type in the world, which is crazy. But it is. This, is also a new segment. this is also a new segment, so which makes it like less crazy, fortunately. Well, you uh, created the segment, to be honest. I don't know any other tool that does this, at least not on the same level. Where I, I I think we are the loudest ones. That's because uh, yes. we are open source, and <laughs> I, I I think that was a very good move. Yeah, definitely. Actually, uh, so we have to spin out from Divante, and obviously, like uh, we because we are spinning off, the company obviously cannot be led by the same people that are leading Divante. So I, I co-founded this store from two and a half years ago together with Piotr Karwatka, and since then I was already. Like I was always actively involved into the technological part mm -hmm. of the software, but not only technological. Uh, and I think I was kind of like a natural cho choice for, for a CTO, even though I think like my current and soon former boss Piotr have put a lot of trust in me. And it was kind of like, it's always a bet because I, I, I wasn't a CTO before. Yeah. But I, I will do my best to do, do the job right. And I think I... I'm not sure if I have the qualities that I will show, but I definitely know like where I would like to see this storefront in the future. And I definitely have a have a vision for that. So let's see if that will work. Um, you know what? What's an interesting part is I, I've worked lately with more um, startups, just helping with a bit of consulting or stuff like that, or discussing partnerships. And basically all of them have a different idea of what is a CTO. So if you are not um, a company like Valtech or Accenture, a CTO can basically just be a tinkerer or someone who's the, the, the brain behind the stuff and just says, let me go to my basement and code this stuff. You can also choose mm -hmm. to be more the Valtech type, which is more um, organizational focused. 
and which is more mm-hmm. sales focused. Like you can go any way. So I would say it's going to be a success no matter what you choose because you can make that role, right? If you have a vision, run with it. So, mm-hmm. um, right, I just no- mentioned it before. We have this Mac Alliance, which is like a new thing. It's like an alliance of multiple companies that came together that are all in the same sphere as few storefront. And you guys joined this, but would you mind explaining what the Mach Alliance is and why you guys Mm -hmm. joined? And maybe is this part of your vision also? Yes, it is definitely part of our vision. So like uh, Mach Alliance in in, in short words is kind of like a movement that is concentrated around uh, evangelizing and promoting and using, of course, modern approach to building e-commerce software. So like what this Mach is standing for is M is microservices based, then A is API first, C was uh, cloud, cloud native, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and uh, H was uh, for headless. Exactly. So this is basically a modern e-commerce stack. And why this is important? I think this, this, this is really important, not only for us as a developers, because like developers obviously know uh, the, the value of modern technological stack, but also for the mer- merchants, because the old approach, the, the monolith approach, and the single single vendor approach was working in a way that you were choosing your e-commerce platform. And if you weren't satisfied with, uh, with with some certain features of this e-commerce platform, you were basically either had to wait for, 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 for them on the roadmap or provide feedback, but basically you were locked in to your vendor capabilities. Yeah, exactly. And there, wa- there wasn't much you were able to do with that. So if you will approach this from this modern way, you have a full flexibility of choosing all the third party services that are actually fitting your requirements the best. So let's say you don't like the way how your order management is working. So if you're using this modern stack and headless APIs, it's pretty straightforward to actually just use another service for that specific piece. And by doing this, basically your e-commerce platform is becoming kind of like a skeleton for your applications. And on mm-hmm. top of that, you're choosing the services, different services that are focused on very small pieces uh, that are fitting your needs best. And obviously, like your business is all, also growing, your business is also changing. So you're most likely be, be changing your technological stack over the time. And you, you will probably be constantly changing your technological stack. Some, you know, tweaking some pieces, something is not working well. Uh, something has changed the, the pricing. You know, stuff happens. And what is very important in e-commerce industry, I think, is flexibility. And and the Mach approach is giving this flexibility. Okay, so then the, the, the goal of the group is to evangelize this approach of work, I imagine. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, exactly. who exactly. else is is in the Mach approach or in the alliance? So, <laughs> many many companies and more more of them joining. So, so we have not only e-commerce vendors like us, but also e-commerce agencies. I think one of one of the founders is also Vatec, where where, yes. where where you work in. Yeah, we are uh, basically one of the founders. I think I'm assuming. I think we we started it with some others. Hmm. Yes, this, this this is also what, what what I have seen. There are also CMSs like Appliance. There are also e-commerce platform like Commerce Tools, which is also one of the founders. Yeah. So this is a really really big movement, and all of these e-commerce vendors and e-commerce agencies they're cooperating and evangelizing together, also pitching together. It's much easier actually, you know, to pitch. This modern approach, when you have all the all, 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 all the pieces, so you know, client is asking for a CMS. There is a company in Mach Alliance for CMS. You're asking for order management. There is a company asking for order management, and you are sure that they are 100% hands on into this movement. So it's it's it's, it's much safer actually to re- recommend them. So this I, honestly, I, really I love like this. This is a great yes. approach. Because it's kind of what what I, what I'm noticing in the where I work in this enterprise level stuff is that it's really scary for big clients to choose smaller companies, and because they are already locked into the fender of like a big thing, like a big monolith with the whole suite of stuff, and every time we pitch, mm-hmm. it was really hard to actually get across like there is an alternative that might be cheaper or better for the environment or stuff like that. Uh, 
So actually, mm-hmm. this Mach Alliance now gives it some sort of credibility. That's what I feel it does. Yeah. Um, yes, so- exactly. And it's also kind of like a great journey for partnerships. Like once we joined the Mach Alliance, some companies from the Alliance approached us and asked like, hey, guys, do you want to make an integration? Then do you want to write a blog post together or something like that? So it's also a really good opportunity to, to actually collaborate and to show some real examples of how powerful this, this Mach approach could be. Together we have pretty, pretty huge companies. So it's yeah, exactly. really, really, really cool stuff. Now that you are a CTO and you're, tr- you're slowly splitting off from Defante, right? But you're mm-hmm. building this open source tool. But how are you funding your company? How are you able to pay the salaries of your people? Yeah, so that's, that's the tricky part. <laughs> yes, and this uh, is probably also based on how you see your future, right? There might be different choices to be made here. Yeah, I think like the big biggest issue of all uh, open source maintainers is how to make money on this. Yes, yes? it is. Because like from, 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 from the one point of view, when you're very open and when you're giving away a lot of stuff for free, people are excited about this, people are trusting you, people like this approach, and you can be very successful yep. with this with this approach. And we did that. But if you give away too much and don't think about earning on this from the day zero, you might end up with a situation where you have a very successful product but there is no way to earn money on this because you have given away so much. And like we are coming from the, from an agency. So it wasn't our problem for a very long time because we're basically earning from the services. So we are only promoting the storefront as as openly as possible. The license was MIT, Uh, everything was for free. Uh, And we as a company were earning on actually the fact that we are originators, we are creators of the software. So then we can provide the best possible services, yes? Yeah, so you implement the stuff. That was how you made the money. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. But right now we are spinning off. And we have to find another business model. Yeah, I can imagine. Fortunately, fortunately, this is not something that, you know, is, is, is... this is this is this is not something new like Ernie on open source and there are very good examples of companies that have made that and fortunately we are also fitting more or less into the same pattern than everyone so when you have okay. a, when, when when you have an open source software you can't compete with your open source uh, offering that's the worst thing you can do because it will piece of the community and then you will be like competing with your own community and it's, 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 it's never a good idea. So it's no. much wiser actually to find places where your community, for example, is struggling with, uh, like hosting, like uh, some consulting, like training, stuff like that. So then you could provide additional services on top of your software while still supporting software. There is a great, great podcast. It's called Open Source Underdogs, okay. where uh, a very prominent personas of, of the open source world are uh, interviewed. And all of them are basically telling about their business models and how they're earning money, etc. So that was also our approach to find actually what our users are struggling with, also what clients are struggling with and what open source version cannot provide. For example, for enterprise users, even though open source is a big plus, they they need they are lacking this this uh, this trust. To the software because it's maintained by a lot of people when something goes wrong actually who will be responsible for this yes yeah man so i'm always talking know. slas contracts services professional services all the crazy stuff that's the first thing my client will ask yeah exactly so that's another thing that we could provide we could provide a services that are actually hosting this we storefront and that are providing additional services around this so when merchants are choosing this they can be very confident in this choice. And they know that if something goes wrong, there is someone who will handle this and the someone is actually creating the software. So we are sure that the quality of the service will be high. Oh yeah, that's so, great. Yeah, so this is our main uh, main main goal to have a cloud version of this storefront where we are okay. offering this additional services. We also want to add a visual reader on top of that. Uh, also a builder that is meant to customize software to components. So 
I really believe that like in a year or two from now, we'll have a very, very competitive platform that will actually enable merchants to, to, to use this storefront as the last front end they would ever need. This Whoa. is, this, 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 Evangelize this is my dream. So, Give me more, give me more. <laughs> I'm <laughs> just kidding. Yes. So, no, so let, let, let's imagine that you, you have a very small business. Right now, we are we are pitching only to enterprises with this Vista from Pro or Vista from Enterprise. Actually, the name is, is not is not yet established, even though the product is there. The name is yeah. not established. Uh, so, imagine that you are a small merchant and you're you're creating a store on this uh, on on this Vista from Cloud. And you have a visual builder, then you have a visual picker of the CMS, of uh, some payment gateways, etc. Everything is made visual. Yeah. And at some point, your business is growing, and those out-of-the-box features are not enough. Because you are using this storefront, you still have full control over the code, so you can go a little bit deeper, change some components from the code perspective, maybe add some more to this visual builder, and you're good to go for some time. Then you're it's, it's getting even uh, more advanced, so you can still access the code. So you can build your own integrations that are not in the marketplace. And at some point, you you will probably end up with a fully custom uh, solution. Yeah. But from, from from the day zero to the moment when you're a huge international company, you don't have to change the front end because like you still have access to everything. Everything is configurable, but it's configurable on different levels. So this this is what I believe is is, is the future. Uh, of, of this storefront. It sounds great. You know what this this sounds like? You have to just release the next version, let people run with it. And in a couple of months, basically, I'd love to interview you again. And then in the second half of the video, you're just going to show me some stuff about your new products. Because I feel like I, I can already sell a few storefront easily. Like people love it already. Imagine if it's more mature and you can actually have a hosted version and you can have good connections to, let's say, Storyblock stuff like that, or how that works with Next. You know, I'm really excited about this. This is cool stuff, man. Yeah, yes, yes. And you see, like, when when, you, when you're, when that, you that's also one of our problems, that when you're a developer, and when you're pitching a good software to developers, they will always see the value. But to be honest, we had troubles pitching it to, to the business people. Yeah. Because when, when we're pitching it to the business people, we, we often get asked, like, what is a CMS? Yeah, sure. So what, exactly. Yeah, so that yeah, so that could be problematic, and this is also the reason why we created this cloud because business people just want to hear that everything will be will, will be taken care of. Yeah, they want to be trusted. They would just want to say, "Give me this thing, I'll give you a shitload of money, and it just works." Mm -hmm. This is kind of the approach. Yes, exactly, yeah. exactly. So right now we we have a pretty vibrant community of developers, and now we want to and like make this community more welcoming for, for, for people that are not directly developers, but let, let's call them like technical marketers yeah. uh, and also business owners. Cool, man. I think that's a really nice end to our conversation. I really want to thank you for joining and for explaining this a little bit more technically. Um, and I hope that people who are not super technical still look at your talk and actually start to understand the potential of the platform. So thanks again for your time, man. This is super cool. Thank you, Tim. Thanks, thanks, thanks right, for man. interviewing me. I really hope to see you soon in person, when you can again. Yeah, I really hope to. Maybe not in the individual in Amsterdam this, this year, but maybe next year. Yeah, exactly. All right, man. See ya. Cheers. Bye-bye. Hey.